I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we analyze the latest statements from Vladimir Putin, Yevgeny Prigozhin, and Alexander Lukashenko following this weekend's failed mutiny. We discuss the continuing fallout from the Hakovka Dam explosion. And I interview British volunteer Felicity Spector, who's traveling across Ukraine with the non-profit organization Bake for Ukraine. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in faith. We need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 27th of June, one year and 123 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today I'm joined by our assistant comment editor Francis Sternley, senior foreign correspondent Roland Oliphant, and deputy global health editor Sam Lovett. I started by asking Francis for the latest updates from Ukraine. Well, thanks, David. It goes without saying that the world is still reeling from the events of last week, which we'll, of course, turn to. But the battlefield has been far from static. So I'm going to start there, if I may. The British MOD has reported that Ukrainian airborne forces have made small advances east from the village of Krasnohovka near Donetsk city. Interestingly, this would be the well, one of the first instances since Russia's full scale invasion last year that Ukrainian forces recaptured an area of territory occupied by Russia since 20. 2014. The MOD also indicates that Russian forces likely lack operational level reserves that could reinforce against simultaneous Ukrainian threats on multiple areas of the front, chiefly Bakhmut and southern Ukraine. Now, on that subject, according to the Institute for the Study of War, Ukrainian forces have made progress into sectors. Oleksandr Sielski, the commander of the Ukrainian Eastern Group of Forces, announced that Ukrainian troops successfully cleared a Russian bridge head across the Donbass Canal in the Bakhmut direction. Additionally, Russian bloggers claimed that Ukrainian forces made advances southwest of Bakhmut. Now, Russian sources have seemingly confirmed that Ukrainian forces are continuing their counteroffensive operations in the administrative border around and between Donetsk and Zaporizhia oblasts. The Russian Ministry of Defense asserted that Russian forces repelled Ukrainian ground attacks in the south of Urahiv in western Zaporizhia oblast. Yet Colonel Valery Shershin, spokesperson for the Ukrainian soldiers in that region, has stated that Ukrainian forces have advanced approximately one and a half kilometres in an unspecified area of the Zaporizhia direction. Now, if true, that would mean that Ukrainian forces have effectively recaptured 130 square kilometres of territory in southern Ukraine since the beginning of the counteroffensive. Though, of course, we cannot yet independently verify that. But nonetheless, it's inching forward. And as you can see, that's not an insignificant amount of territory reclaimed. Now, in relation to the recent military and drone strikes conducted by Russian forces on Ukraine, we obviously spoke about the ones on Sunday night yesterday. And Dom mentioned that the Ukrainian general staff reported the successful downing of two of three Russian caliber cruise missiles and seven out of eight Shahid drones by Ukrainian Forces. Now, an interesting note regarding this incident is that a spokesperson for the Ukrainian Southern Operational Command has highlighted that the presence of strong storms over the Black Sea posed challenges for Ukrainian air defences in intercepting these targets. Now, we rarely hear this, but it has been rumoured. So it's interesting to see that confirmed. Now, Roland's going to talk more about Prigozhin, but the top headline this morning is that a private jet belonging to him has landed at a military airfield near Minsk in Belarus. The jet took off from an airfield in Rostov, we understand. Now, there's been no official confirmation of who was on board, but the identification codes of the aircraft match those of a jet linked by the United States to Autolex Transport, which is linked to Prigozhin by the US Office of Foreign Assets Control. It came as Russia's FSB security services announced that it was dropping a case against Wagner fighters accused of staging an armed mutiny. Now, in terms of the impact of that incident on the military chain of command, analysts are saying today 
that the Kremlin is likely to signal that Sergei Shoigu will maintain his position as Minister for Defence for the time being to avoid the perception that Putin will not give in to Prigozhin's blackmail. The Russian MAD interestingly reported that Shoigu visited an unspecified forward command post in Ukraine yesterday, which would be his first public appearance since Prigozhin's drive towards Moscow. Nevertheless, I think it's fair to say that his position is in peril. This is a huge humiliation and failure for Shoigu personally. And Putin will no doubt be weighing up the long term well, whether Shoigu's personal loyalty is worth his evident ineffectiveness. In the short term, most probably it is worth it, but in the long term, almost certainly not, given what's taken place. So that's where we are on the military front, David. But as I say, Roland certainly will have more thoughts on the Prigozhin saga. Thank you very much, Francis. Oh, Roland, let's go to you. Yesterday, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the the seeming lack of reaction from some of the key players in this attempted coup, this mutiny. Now we've heard from Vladimir Putin, Yevgeny Prigozhin and Alexander Lukashenko this morning. Can you talk us through what we've heard and what you make of it? Yeah, so I think the simplest thing is I'm just going to take it in chronological order with, with, with a few highlights. So first of all, last night, Prigozhin finally reappears after a minute's silence and puts out one of his, one of his cherished voice messages. This is his favoured way of communicating with the world. Um, is putting out a voice note. So it was a long one. It's about 10 minutes long. I'm just going to read out a few of the um, highlights. He basically says, OK, why did we do this? We did this um, because we realised we were going to be disarmed. We were told that Wagner was going to be disbanded by the 1st of July. We were trying to find a way to, to get out of that. We were talking to people, didn't work. We we put all of our equipment in a in a field camp in, in eastern Ukraine, basically, and we were going to hand it all over if we had to. And then even though we didn't do anything, we came under rocket attack and aviation attack by the Russian armed forces. Several of our guys were killed. And then we realized we had no choice. So that's why we we went for Rostov and Moscow. He says, during the whole march, which lasted 24 hours, one column went to Rostov and one went to Moscow. I think that's a, a, a An interesting point, because at the time, we weren't quite sure how many columns were running around. But it wasn't that they went to Rostov and then they started going up the M4. They were already heading towards Moscow with a different column when it began, which explains how they got so far so quickly. So during the whole march, which lasted 24 hours, one column to Rostov, one to Moscow, we covered 780 kilometers. Not a single soldier was killed on the ground. We regret that we had to carry out strikes on aviation assets. But these assets dropped bombs and carried out rocket strikes on us. So that's him confirming they shot down the Russian aircraft and helicopters. We got to within 200 kilometers of Moscow, 200 plus a little bit. In that time, we uh, we blockaded all the military bases on the road. I repeat, we didn't kill anybody. Um, And he says, why did we stop? Well, we got to about 200 kilometers from Moscow. We stopped when our first assault detachments carried out reconnaissance of the area and it became obvious at that moment that there was going to be a lot of bloodshed. So we calculated that the demonstration of what we'd intended to do was sufficient. Our decision to turn around was based on two factors. The first was that we did not want to spill Russian blood. The second was we were going for a demonstration. Uh, We were not taking power in the country. And at that moment, Alexander Lukashenko raised his hand and proposed finding a solution. And then we get this supposed deal that that Alexander Lukashenko has has claimed credit for. I'll just skip a little bit further through. In his conclusion, the point he's really trying to jam home here is, number one, we did not have the objective of overthrowing the current regime or the elected government, as many have said. Number two, we exposed a lot of the weaknesses that we were complaining about. You know, how are we able to to march so fast through through Russian sovereign territory? Um, We showed there are huge security problems all across the country. But look, everywhere we went, civilians met us with the flags of Russia and with the emblems of Wagner. They were happy to see us when we arrived, happy as we rolled past. Some of them are still sending me words of support. Some are upset that we stopped because they saw our march for justice, even though our struggle was for Wagner's struggle for survival. They saw it as a supporting the fight against bureaucracy and other ills that we have in the country today. So... In a day, we got to within 200 kilometers of Moscow. We entered and established full control over Rostov. Civilians were glad to see us. We gave a masterclass in what the 24th of February 2022 should have looked like. In other words, if you'd let us invade Ukraine, we would have got the job done. And it could have been done in one day. So that's Evgeny Prigozhin's side of things. Vladimir Putin then had a a five-minute address last night where he kind of walked this interesting line between condemning the rebellion and making clear he thinks of Mr. Prigozhin as a traitor without upsetting the actual fighters. So 
This is Putin last night. The organizers of the rebellion were betraying their country, their people, and also betrayed those who were drawn into the crime. They So the leaders, talking about how the leaders treated the Wagner troops, they lied to them, pushed them to death under fire to shoot at their own. It was precisely this outcome, this fratricide, that Russia's enemies wanted. We do know that the overwhelming majority of the Wagner group are also operators of Russia. They approved it by their courage on the battlefield. They were being used. I thank those soldiers who prevented bloodshed, who stopped at the final line. Now you have a chance to continue your service by signing a contract with the Ministry of Defence or other law enforcement agencies, or you can go back to your families, or if you like, you can go to Belarus. I will keep my promise. So again, from Putin, a very strange double think here on the one hand saying this is an absolutely inadmissible high treason that 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 cannot be in any way forgiven and yet at the same time don't worry with will uh, <laughs> i understand most of you are patriots most of you can go home this morning he spoke again he's gathered the uh, the heads of most of the law enforcement the military agencies and the kremlin for a kind of thanksgiving ceremony he said, thank you very much. Uh, you've defended the constitutional order. He paid tribute to the helicopter pilots who died. In this difficult situation, you acted precisely and harmoniously. You've proved your deeds, your loyalty to the Russian people and the military oath. You have shown responsibility for the fate of our motherland and its future. You would think that they've just refought the Battle of Stalingrad by, by the sounds of things. So on. Then we have Alexander Lukashenko, who has claimed credit for brokering the deal between Mr. Putin and Mr. Prigozhin. It's quite interesting. He says, like, don't don't call me, we're not heroes. Don't make call me a hero. Don't call Putin a hero. Don't call um, Mr. Prigozhin a hero. We failed to see the situation and we thought it would all blow over. It didn't blow over. And two people who had fought on the front together, he means Mr. Sh- Sergei Shoigu, the defense minister, and Mr. Prigozhin, clashed. There are no heroes in this situation. He also says... I gave the order to bring um, Belarus's army to full combat readiness when this was going on. And he also says that, look, if Russia collapsed, then we will all die. And the West would take advantage of it. And so very much kind of harnessing himself to the future of Putin's Russia there. There's one more thing. I know it's been going on, but a lot have been speaking. We also got some comments from Viktor Zolotov. Viktor Zolotov is the head of the Russian National Guard. That's the agency that is in charge of putting down internal rebellions. He's the guy who should have been in charge of dealing with this. Now, he spoke to some Russian media after this ceremony at the Kremlin today. And he said, they said, well, how, how did these guys get so close to Moscow? He said, well, we were concentrating our forces on the outskirts of Moscow because if they were spread out, the mercenaries, quote, would have cut through them like a knife through butter. They said, well, if they'd, if they'd carried on, would they have got into Moscow? He said, yes, they would have approached Moscow, but they would not have taken Moscow. Um, and he also claimed that the mutiny, they knew the mutiny was going to happen. They had intelligence about it from people within Wagner, but events moved so fast, they were unable to stop the, the fall of Rostov. And he also claimed that um, the military acted excellently. Everything was wonderful. In Dom's words, I'll take a pause there. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Roland. Can I ask you, now we've heard from the, unlike yesterday, now we have heard from the sort of key players in this drama, How now we're several days on as well, how has all this informed your thinking as to what exactly went down, what exactly happened on, on Saturday? I mean, I'm just thinking in terms of James Kilner came on yesterday and advanced quite tentatively some of his thoughts, that he, he sort of thought that it might be an accidental coup, that really what Prigozhin was trying to do was yeah, demonstrate demonstrate force, bring Putin to the negotiating table and get what he wanted and actually found that the road to Moscow was unguarded and he could just carry on and then suddenly didn't know what to do. That's that's I'm sort of summarising it slightly, but that was James's thoughts on that. How Now we've heard from the, the key players. What do you think happened? I mean, the way it's worked out is as a mutiny rather than as a coup. And, and by mutiny, I mean, yeah, like, like a military protest, military industrial action. And this is um, the Royal Navy actually had a very a very strong tradition of this until recent centuries. The sailors would mutiny, but it meant going on strike because they were unhappy with conditions, things like that. And it was it was almost understood that this was something that could happen and things would be resolved and ringleaders would probably be hung. But but nonetheless, um, it obviously wasn't a, an attempt to you know challenge power and things like that. I must say I'm not convinced by that. I think as soon as you have a man in military uniform who has sent a flying column up the road towards Moscow standing in front of a camera saying this is not a coup uh, i'm afraid that you know it's, it's alarm bells ringing in my head however it turned out it did turn out that way i don't know 
I mean, I, I, I have a feeling that there were definitely ambitions. If you start driving up towards Moscow like that, um, you know, see how far it goes. Maybe James is right. Maybe they didn't realize it would go so far. But from what Mr. Prigozhin said, he'd already made that decision to go towards Moscow straight away. Right? So we're going to seize Rostov. They obviously wanted to arrest uh, Sergei Shoigu and Valery Gesarimov, the, uh, the head of general staff. And Prigozhin said that, oh, Gerasimov got away uh, before we could get here when he got to Rostov. So he was seeking to arrest top-level members of the of the military establishment, and and you'd have to be pr- maybe he is quite dumb, but I mean, how you could possibly conceive of doing that as not challenging Vladimir Putin's authority? I don't know what planet you're on. So I personally think it probably was a coup attempt or whatever you want to call it. Vladimir Putin clearly won. Sergei Shoigu clearly run. However. These guys have the leverage not to wind up executed, shot, wiped out, and going into exile, at least for now. And I think that 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 says a lot. I think even though it's quite clear that the Russian establishment has won, that everything that was meant to happen happened, nobody came out for Prigozhin. Everybody came out for, for the Kremlin and Mr. Putin. It has exposed weaknesses. One of the weaknesses is that Roskavadia was not capable of taking on an outfit like 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 Wagner. And Mr. Zolotov said this morning, yes, I was talking to the president about that. We are going to get heavy weapons, tanks, that kind of thing. So Roskvadi are now going to be equipped not just to take on, you know, wishy-washy middle-class protesters. They're going to be equipped to take on an armed insurgency, which was a threat they were they were missing. And, and the other problem, quite an enormous problem, is that I think we've all now, for about 24 hours, we were able to imagine what the end of the end of Putin's rule could look like, which it's been impossible to imagine for 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 a very long time. And and the fact that you get, you know, if you if you go onto Red Square holding a piece of paper saying no to war, you might end up in prison for seven years. If you if you march an army on Moscow and kill fifteen Russian Air Force pilots, you you get to go and retire to Belarus. That that tells you something, I think, about about the way things work there and about the security of the regime. So my Bottom line, I don't think this is the fatal crack in Vladimir Putin's authority that it looks like, but I, I, I definitely think it's a very significant earthquake, if you see what I mean. Thanks, Roland. I'll come back to you later if that's all right, because I want to ask just a couple of questions about what you think this means for Alexander Lukashenko and Belarus. But first, I know we want to get on to Sam Lovett. So, but before that, Francis, can you talk us through some of the political updates that you've been looking at? Well, thanks, David. I just want to echo Roland's analysis there. You don't march on Moscow, a city that has such huge symbolic and historic resonance, somewhere that's resisted invasions numerous times in Russian history and not know that it's going to be interpreted as a coup. I keep thinking back to that children's book Pogosian wrote that had the plot line of a man who tries to overthrow the king that's been there too long. One can't help but think in that context that he may have been romanticised about doing something like this for a very long time indeed. But I'm sure we'll have more thoughts on that throughout the week. We've discussed the potential strategic implications of Prigozhin's actions on the bonus episode that went out on Saturday. But another area we didn't touch on then that is worth underlining is the economic impact of it. Sue Chan, of course, a regular on the pod, uh, economics reporter for us, head of economics coverage on these matters, has written an interesting piece on how Wagner's attempted mutiny has put wheat prices on course for their biggest monthly gain in eight years. It sent the ruble tumbling and triggered a surge in gas prices as international markets lost confidence. Indeed, the value of the Russian ruble sank to its lowest level in nearly 15 months against the dollar, whilst European natural gas prices rose as much as 14% on Monday before easing back. Gas prices had already leapt by around 20% this month, driven largely by prolonged production outages in Norway. So all of this had a big impact on Russia's markets and the global market too. Ripples were felt. Russia is forecast to be the biggest grain exporter this year. and Any shift in its shipments due to disruption would have a significant impact on global flows. Indeed, Russia's first deputy prime minister said demand for cash in 15 Russian regions increased by as much as 80 percent. It prompted queues outside banks, whilst traffic around supermarkets in some regions near Rostov surged as people stockpiled food. 
The head of Russia's central bank had already issued a warning that inflation risks taking off in the coming months after Putin ordered more people to the front last September. And a Goldman Sachs analyst summed up the mood in the markets that the civil unrest in Russia over the weekend illustrates the fragility of the current Russian political situation and the importance of understanding the risks to Russia's supply associated with potential domestic upheaval. The first response could be that the army intensifies its search for conscripts and volunteers amid a very tight labour market. The significance being there, of course, that a, with a very tight labour market, losing more people will also have an impact on the economy that could be quite damaging. In that vein, Leon Peach, senior emerging markets economist at Capital Economics, believes Putin will be forced to drain his war chest further in an effort to appease militarist factions. He says there are significant long term implications. Quote, Russia's economy has found an equilibrium that preserves low inflation and stable balance sheets and positive growth in the face of sanctions by operating a relatively limited war effort. But then he says that policymakers have not been forced to adapt policies that sacrifice stability for the war, but that could now change. Change, As Sue stresses in her piece, bigger wage bill and more military spending risks stoking inflation and depleting the government's coffers as the war already threatens to bleed Putin's chest dry. Russia's deficit in the first five months of this year stood at $14.9 billion. That's come from the Russian finance ministry. Now, of course, we don't always trust their figures, but nonetheless, it's quite a major admission, even if those figures are massaged, with spending... 26.5% higher year on year. Income was down 18.5%. Whilst the surge in oil prices boosted Moscow's finances at the start of the war, there's now heading in reverse. Russia's National Wealth Fund stood at around $155 billion at the start of this month, compared with $175 billion at the start of this war. Again, that's according to the country's finance ministry. So all is not merry in the Russian finances. And there is an irony here that Russia has managed to keep its economy afloat despite international sanctions, yet has now been harmed by internal rather than external forces. So we'll be monitoring that very closely. And I know that we've had considerable debate on this programme about whether economic impacts of sanctions have really been felt in Russia. And it did, does seem that in the long term, the picture may not be rosy, but in the short term, Russia has been able to keep things relatively afloat. But as I say, though, this will trigger some major question marks. And there'll be a lot of economists who are now looking at the long term implications of the shock caused by Prigozhin's actions. Now, two very other brief political stories. We've talked a lot about the F-16s question and an international programme to train Ukrainian pilots to fly F-16 fighter jets is now being drawn up by Western countries. And the length of such a course could vary depending on pilots' prior training and language skills. That's coming out of Denmark today. So Denmark and the Netherlands are now leading efforts by the International Coalition to train pilots and support staff, maintain aircraft and ultimately supply F-16s to Ukraine and defend... Uh, Denmark's defence ministry has said in a statement to Reuters that the dialogue and planning of this is still ongoing, which is why there is no final plan yet. And as we discussed last week, it is clear that one of the reasons the counteroffensive has not been as successful is the relative air superiority of Russia. And we've heard that from analysts as well as soldiers on the ground. And I think there has been a recognition now amongst many international partners that more must be done to treat that as a priority. And I suppose the tragedy from Ukraine's perspective that they've been saying this for many, many months now. And yet once again, it has taken a long time for the West to wake up and soldiers will die as a consequence of that delay. Now, lastly, just a story from the UN. They've been monitoring the impact of civilians, of course, since the war began and have said that Russia has detained more than 800 civilians since February last year, of whom 77 were executed. The report showed, too, that Ukraine has violated some international law by arbitrarily detaining detaining civilians, but on a considerably smaller scale. This is a quote from the report. The UN identified patterns of conduct which have resulted in arbitrary detention as well as further human rights violations, including torture, ill-treatment and enforced disappearances. 
the, whilst such contact was found in relation to both parties in the conflict, there was far greater prevalence of conduct attributed to forces of the Russian Federation. Now, I'm going to return to this subject again in the next week or so because I think it's a very important one. And if anything, I think these numbers are much lower than perhaps is the reality. Certainly, according to our reporting, I believe these are much lower. But of course, it takes a lot to stand up the numbers concerned. And so I think that once we have a clearer picture of certain areas, of course, being liberated as well, those numbers will increase. But these will be the verified figures that the UN has been able to get confirmation of as far as this, of course, tragic situation is concerned. But that's where we are in the political realm, David. Thank you very much, Francis and Roland. Roland and Francis will come back to you. I'd like to turn to Sam Lovett, Deputy Editor of the Telegraph's Global Health Securities Desk. Sam, thank you so much for joining us. You've written quite a long read for the Telegraph website about what you call Ukraine's toxic water crisis. It's a, it's a fascinating read. I'd, I'd advise everybody listening to go and read it. Could I start by asking, because one point you make fairly early on is that even before the destruction of the Kharkovka Dam in southeastern Ukraine, uh, Ukraine was suffering with uh, water quality and, and, and had a water crisis. Could you talk a little bit about how the war has impacted that aspect of, of, of Ukraine's ecology? And then we can talk a little bit more about the dam later. Sure, yeah. It, it was quite an interesting um, turn of events, really, in, in the sense that it, it was a piece that I'd been looking into researching before the dam was destroyed. And... Uh, from all the conversation that I, I'd, I'd been having with various experts, they were warning around the, um, the various reservoirs on the river, which were at risk of being destroyed and, and releasing sort of their water in, into farmlands, um, disrupting mines buried in the ground, etc. And that was just one aspect which they flagged. A particular point of interest for me was the fact that in the east of Ukraine, you have around 220 coal mines, which over the years have either been abandoned, closed down, and you have, you have various pump, pumping systems in place which act as a means to prevent water from filling up these mines. And, and obviously this water contains very toxic, heavy materials which then go on to pollute the groundwater and various surface water supplies. And because of war, the various power outages, these mines are now filling up at a significant rate. And the fear is that this water is going to pollute various water supplies in the region, making it difficult, well, making it that people can no longer drink the water out of their taps, they can't use it for bathing, etc. So that's one particular aspect of that. And, and, and actually one expert said that the, uh, sort of the environmental pollution linked to, to these, these flooding mines is sort of one of the greatest threats to Ukraine in, in, in the long term. On top of the mines, you have these, sort of these vast canals and water systems, again, in, in the east of the country, which are used for farming, for water supplies, which are being used as dumping sites, effectively, for munitions, military equipment. Again, you have the release of these very toxic materials into the water, meaning that people, again, can't access it. It, it disrupts farming. We know that sort of that part of Ukraine is is um, massive for sort of export of, of grains, crops, etc. And if farmers can't access the water there, that risks sort of further for, sort of food insecurity, not just within Ukraine, but beyond its borders as well. So you, you sort of have this issue going on long before the dam was breached, but the sort of the, the destruction of the dam, the subsequent re release of, of the water, I think is the clearest manifestation of Ukraine's water crisis. And, and as we, we've seen in, in, in the headlines in, in, in recent weeks, the impacts of that are just going to be absolutely catastrophic in the months and even years to come. Thanks very much, Sam. Well, let's talk about that a little bit more. One of the quotes you've got in the piece from Professor Clement Tochner, Director General of the Senckenberg Society for Nature Research, he says, it will require an immense global effort to clean up the water. I think we cannot even realise how huge the effort will be. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, I was struck by several com conversations I was having in Ukraine over the past few weeks about, about exactly this, that it's not completely understood how just how long it will take to to clean up the disaster after the destruction of the dam. Why will it take so long? And what will be the issues in the months and years to come? Well, I think that the scale of it is, is the first thing. It's quite hard to get our head around how much water has been released from the reservoir. So to, to give you a figure, it's some 4.3 cubic miles of brown and drinkable water has been released 
uh, from the dam into the surrounding area. It's about 230 square miles of land that's been effective. So first of all, you, you, you have the size of it. You have croplands which have been destroyed. You have chemicals from, from these cultivated fields being swept downstream. There's industrial waste that's been swept away from sort of nearby industrial plants. And then at least 150 tonnes of machine oil from the dam itself being distributed into the surrounding region. One point which I hadn't even considered and I I found particularly interesting, and this came from a a nature study from March 2023, that said the breaching of dams along the Dnieper River, upon which the reservoir sits, poses a danger of secondary radioactive pollution due to uncontrolled release of radioactive material accumulated in the sediments after the Chernobyl explosion. So you have this catastrophic event 30, 40 years ago, the impacts of that still potentially being felt today as a result of the breaching of the dam and the releasing of these radioactive materials in the river sediments. But one of the issues, and it's a big issue, is that there isn't the ability to properly assess and determine the toxicity of um, waterways in, in parts of Ukraine. So you do have this scenario where people are accessing water not knowing if it's toxic or not, if, it, if it's clean, etc. I, I think sort of more in central Ukraine, there's, there's greater visibility on this issue. But in, in, the, in those parts which are occupied by Russia, there is a complete lack of visibility around the issue. Finally, Sam, can we talk a little bit about uh, the parts of Ukraine that even though no longer under Russian occupation, are still struggling to access clean water? Uh, you, you've written a little bit about Mykolaiv. Uh, Mykolaiv wasn't occupied, but it sits very close to the front line. What's their struggle like to access clean water in that city? Yeah, sure. So at, at the start of the war, as I understand it, you had pipes carrying water from the Dnieper River to Mykolaiv, which were destroyed and it forced the city to turn to another water source. But this particular water source had a very high chloride content, meaning that residents cannot drink the water, are reluctant to wash in it, as I understand. And and it's so toxic that th- this new water supply is actually corroding pipes in the city. I think I spoke to one expert who said they typically they, they would have sort of two to three leaks to deal with at any given time, and, and, and now it's up to 15 so, th- so there's that particular issue. The, the, the city is proving robust. They're bringing in water tanks as purified water distribution points. People are even digging wells to draw up water from groundwater supplies. So people are being smart a- about this. But I think it, it, it's a very clear example of, of how the war is impacting something which we take for granted on our, in our day-to-day lives. Thanks, Sam. Anything more from you that you think our listeners should understand? One expert who I, who, who I spoke with made an interesting point that water h- has always been weaponized in, in, in conflict, which is something that I hadn't really taken into consideration. And there's two reasons for this. This particular expert said it's one to affect morale, crush the spirit of, of the nation. And then there's, the, there's maybe a more strategic approach to doing so to drive people or, or troops away from a certain location but f- of everyone who I, who I spoke to for this particular piece they were all resilient d- defiant saying it, it's not going to have any impact on their commitment to winning this war so I thought that was yeah quite an interesting point to take away from that. Well thank you very much Sam for joining us. Roland, can I come back to you? We've spoken a lot about this the mutiny, this coup, whatever you want to call it. One person I'd just like to focus on a little bit is Alexander Lukashenko, who played what sounds like a key role in this. How do you think his actions over the past few days have affected him and, and, and the future of Belarus? I mean, he's clearly loving it. <laughs> I've just um, He's just given quite a long kind of chat to Belarusian media about this. And this is, uh, this is his account of how he managed to reach... Um, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the other day, he, he rings up Putin on Saturday morning and Lukashenko says the most dangerous thing, as I understood, was not what the situation was, it was how it could develop and, and what the consequences could come from that. You know, that was the most dangerous thing. I also understood taking a harsh decision, which is, you know, he's, he's quoting Vladimir Putin's public statements back at him, dealing with these people harshly was the most dangerous thing to do. So I said to Putin, 
let's not hurry, let's talk with Prigozhin, with his commanders. To which he said to me, listen, Sasha, it's useless. He won't even pick up the phone. Uh, he doesn't want to talk to us. So I said, where is he? And Putin said, in Rostov. I said, okay, a bad peace is, is better than any war. Don't rush things. I'll try and talk to him. And he said again to me, it's useless. I said, no, okay, wait. And we talked for about half an hour. And then he informed me that he was at the front. I remember his words. He said, I'm at the front. Oddly enough, it's better than it ever was. I said, you see, not everything's so bad. And at 11 o'clock, I, I, it took me a while to find all these phones and things. I said, okay, how do I contact him? Give me his phone number. And Putin says, well, probably the FSB's got his number. So we worked it out, and then then soon we had we had three channels up, and I was talking to him. So he's he's loving, he's relishing retelling this story, and 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 the implication there is that he talked Putin out of out of harsh measures, and that really he's the guy who who made peace and saved civilian lives and saved everybody's lives, things like that. How he actually comes out of himself, I mean, some people say that this has helped him reassert his autonomy from Vladimir Putin. I'm not sure that's true. I, th I feel like. I feel more like he's a faithful feudal retainer who has performed well in the service of the emperor in a way. And I think Putin will probably reward him for this. I mean, there was some talk of a cheap gas deal um, for Belarus um, in the following this. But I mean, Lukashenko has been on the ropes for a while, you know, since he relied on Russian help to put down um, a massive pro-democracy uprising a couple of years ago. That was the end of his long-term balancing act between Russia and the West. So then he was completely dependent on Putin. He's been under immense pressure from the Kremlin to, to actually join the war, which he doesn't want to do because he knows the, Russian, the Belarusian public would be horrified at that. And so would probably the Belarusian army, to be fair. And, and he was looking at times pretty desperate, pretty corn, pretty under pressure. I think at this point he's looking buoyed with confidence. I think it's definitely bought him more... You know, his stock is up in the Kremlin, which is a good thing for, for Alexander Lukashenko. What it means in the long term, I'm not sure. I mean, he's, he's just been saying things like, well, look, having these Wagner people here will be, will be quite good for us because they're going to they're advise our military and they're going to tell us, you know, about tactics and weapon systems and, and what works and what doesn't. And don't worry, we'll keep a close eye on them. They're not going to cause any trouble. But he seemed to be suggesting they're going to be around for a while. So, you know, Lukashenko, the survivor's survivor, but... but Clearly, I think he's he, he's speaking a blunt truth when he said, look, if Putin goes, if Russia goes down, if there's chaos in Russia, if Putin goes down, we all go down. I think I think that's fair. I think it's very clear to him that his grip on power is at this point dependent on the kind of greater superstructure that Vladimir Putin has built in Russia. And if that collapses and goes, he is also going to be in trouble. But he's definitely definitely got a swagger about him today. Thank you, Roland. Thank you, Sam. Let's move to our final thoughts. Francis Sternley. Well, thanks, David. Of course, we'll be analysing the impact of Prigozhin, not just this week, but for many, many weeks to come. And I've certainly got some more thoughts on it, which I'll discuss later in the week. But since we've talked so much about the impact of the dam, and Sam, of course, has, has spoken about it at length today, I wanted to quote from a listener called Drew, who reached out to us and sent us an email. He's very familiar with this part of Ukraine and wanted to expand a little bit on the impact, the devastating impact that this will have on the area. So I'll quote from his email now. And as I say, very grateful to him for reaching out. It's important to understand something about the culture of the people in the areas affected by Russia's attack on how the attack itself and the lack of an international response has been perceived in Ukraine. Many of the victims live in little houses that they would have built and decorated over several years, often with their own hands. Much of the furniture would have been handed down from parents and grandparents. Ukrainians rarely buy home insurance. There will be no check to help start again. What is lost is lost forever. Ukrainians generally don't trust banks either. They keep their savings in foreign currency, and when they have enough, they buy property or land. Ukrainians pride themselves on using their land to grow food. Many keep chickens, rabbits, cows and pigs. There'll be communities of babushkas whose lives revolve around their gardens, pets and livestock. Gardening for them is not a hobby, but a way of life. Downstream of the dam, all that is now gone. Ukraine is also one of the world's biggest honey producers. Every Ukrainian knows a beekeeper. I remember a friend's father who wouldn't leave home when the Russians attacked because he couldn't leave his bees. For me, one of the most poignant images of the attack on the dam is a photograph of a beehive painted in the national colours floating away in the floodwaters with the bees clinging to the top. 
many Westerners labour under the delusion that the climate in Ukraine is cold and wet. This is ironic because Ukraine actually contains one of Europe's very few deserts. It has a unique habitat, but it's downstream of the dam and is flooded now too. A lot of Ukrainians were raised on stories from their grandparents of the famine in the 30s when the Soviets stole their harvest to feed Russia and sell to the West. Russia may have Dostoyevsky and Tolstoy, but in Ukraine you don't need to read a book the size of a brick to understand something about life. Just ask a babushka about her family history. They've lived through so much. War, famine, occupation, floods, the Nazis, the Soviets, Chernobyl, and now Russia. Many of the houses now underwater will have contained storerooms or cellars with enough jars of pickles and jam to feed a small army, just in case. Now all that sweat and toil has been for nothing. I often joke with my Ukrainian friends that a zombie film set in Ukraine would be the most boring film ever. In the civilised world, when zombies attack, the survivors fight over tinned food, guns and ammunition. Ukrainians would just head to their villages and sow, harvest and pickle. They are survivors. If you know their history, they've had to be. The yellow and blue of the Ukrainian flag represents a wheat field and the sky. Their soil they call Black Earth. This attack has been so shocking because it's an attack on the land itself, the very fabric of Ukraine. You hear the word ecocide used, as previously there was no word to describe deliberate, indiscriminate environmental destruction on the scale of a natural disaster. Ukrainians are extremely grateful for all the moral, financial and military support they have received. But the lack of empathy and action over this attack has caused much consternation. The silence of the Green Movement is shameful. You can bet they'll have plenty to say when the time comes and the money is found to rebuild Ukraine's battered energy infrastructure. But where are they now in Ukraine's hour of need? Well, thank you very much, Francis. And thank you very much to that listener who wrote in. It's hugely appreciated by all of us. To end the episode, can we hear from Roland Oliphant? My, my last thought, since I've been so focused on it, about this, about this uprising, is something that Vladimir Putin said struck me last night. Last night, he, he thanked all of society for coming together to, to, to face down this, this internal threat. And the thing is, I, I don't think that could be further from the truth, to be absolutely honest. I didn't see anybody going out on the roads with their bodies to, to block the mutineers way. Um, there was nothing similar to, to what we saw. Was it was it in 2016 when there was a, a, an attempted coup against President Erdogan in, in Turkey? You had the people opposed to the coup coming out to block bridges and things like that. Nothing of the sort happened. At the same time, you will see a little bit of analysis looking at these social media videos of a few people cheering Wagner fighters in Rostov and a few people bringing flowers to the people on tanks and things like that and saying this shows that there is a huge amount of support for for Wagner. I don't think that's true at all. I think what you're seeing is the consequences of many, many years of very careful cultivation of political apathy in Russia and the basic you'll have heard this again and again and again this is, this is really basic criminology but you know the basic Putin social contract of incremental improvements in the cost of living and the 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 flip side of that well security plus improved living conditions and improved salaries and the the flip side is your political quietism don't get involved it's basically been very very effective but this was it i think showing its flip side to the kremlin very very much i don't think there is a huge constituency who it might sound weird were necessarily really that bothered about who was going to sit in the kremlin at the moment, and I think that is probably why it should worry Putin, but I think it tells us something about how power might eventually change hands in Russia. Thanks, Sam, Dom and Roland. Last week, while in Kyiv, I caught up with British volunteer Felicity Spector, who's been crisscrossing the country supporting the work of non-profit organisation Bake for Ukraine. Here's our conversation from Podil, a northern district of the Ukrainian capital. Felicity, it's wonderful to see you again. It's uh, the last time we spoke, we were in the Telegraph's London offices. Now we're here in Podil, the district of Kyiv, on a beautiful summer's day. What brought you back to Ukraine and what have you been up to here? 
So I've been here for a, a few weeks, basically with a group called Bake for Ukraine, which is a non-profit set up to support the work of bakeries around Ukraine, which give away free bread to people. And they can only continue doing that with the support of donations. So the charity has first of all been identifying these small bakeries and then fundraising and supplying them with the resources to carry on what they're doing. And we had a specific project. Um, Maria, who is one of the co-founders, had been trying to track down a big mobile bakery truck um, that she'd seen in use in Berlin and uh, knew that there were some of them in Ukraine and wanted to find one and help to get more fresh bread to people in places where they don't have access to all the normal facilities. There's no, sh a lot of places that are deoccupied territories and so on, there's no shops anymore, there's hardly any infrastructure left. And it's a big problem for people returning home. Apart from the mine danger, there's also the problem of not having anything to support daily life. What kind of impact do these bakeries have on the ground? How does it change the lives of the people who are, who are receiving this aid? I mean, for a lot of people, it's just, you know, it's a real struggle to keep going. And there's a couple of places I've been to. There's one in Odessa and another one in Kiev that I've visited and one in Bucha. And when the Odessa one set up, they immediately allied with a number of local volunteer groups. Some of them distribute bread. They drive around to villages and there are elderly people who can't get out or families who just don't have any means of transport. A lot of people don't have their own cars and it's very difficult for people to to get fresh food and bread is a really important part of life in Ukraine and they all say all these bakeries say that when they see how happy people are to receive it it's so meaningful to them you know they've been working away often for no money or just living off their savings and so on but it, it really means a lot to them when they can see how valuable it is to people to receive these you know these loaves of bread. What do you make of your Ukrainian contacts sort of morale what they think of the war so far what have they been telling you this trip has anything surprised you? What surprised me is how people still have the energy to cope with... I mean, well, while we were here, the flooding, the Russian attack on the dam in Novokharkovka happened, and it was just yet another absolutely horrendous... And this is all the time while every night there were air raid attacks, and in Odessa in particular, they, that seems to be the new place the Russians want to attack. Three nights running, there were explosions and um, air defence, and a couple of uh, missiles came, got, got through, and there was a lot of damage caused to a university and offices, people's flats... One of the farmers that work with our group, uh, he lives in one of the flats in the block that was hit. And, um, you know, luckily he, no one was hurt, but all his stuff was trashed and covered in broken glass. And um, he said, I guess my morning bike ride is cancelled as he looked at his mangled bicycle in the hallway. And they still retain a sense of humour, which is absolutely incredible. But at the same time, it's so relentless. But immediately the Herson disaster happened. People were like, right, OK, we need to focus on this. What can we do to help? We have a bakery in Kherson, which we were already trying to rush around and get aid for. She also coordinates local support groups and so on, the baker. And she sent us a list of stuff, right? This is what people are going to need. If you can get anything off this list to us, that would be fantastic. So we called in a few donations and things. And, and it people are exhausted and tired and they're also under attack themselves but they know that there are a lot of people who are worse off there are soldiers on the front a lot of people have relations and several people have said to me you might walk around Kiev and you might see people in cafes looking like they're having a nice time and they're sort of smiling but you have no idea what's happening in their life they probably have a husband or boyfriend or their father is on the front lines and every morning they are hoping to receive a text from them saying they're okay or they have had to move from somewhere where their home is destroyed. So under the surface, there's a lot of trauma to process. From this trip to Ukraine, would you tell us a little bit about any sort of standout moments, memories that, that you've had? Well, there are several. There were, when we saw the mobile bakery for the first time, we went to visit it and to give them, uh, you know, put down the payments and so on. And um, Maria organised a test bake uh, so that we could check everything worked on board. And two local women who are home bakers came on and baked 50 loaves of bread with the sourdough recipe. Maria had brought her starter from Odessa so that they could have the proper sourdough starter and everything. And we finished about 11 o'clock at night and everyone was standing around in the car park eating slices of warm bread with butter. And it was just like the best meal anyone had ever had after a long day. And then I was walking through Odessa. I met a pastry chef and restaurateur and... Um, he said, come on, let's... It was the morning after a big attack had happened in the city. And he said, he said, 
we're going to walk past the site where this happened. I want to see it with my own eyes. And um, it's the way I walk to work every day. And he was visibly angry and just at what had happened. And he, he kept saying to me, this is where I, I went to college. I did my culinary course here. That, that building there, I was supposed to be looking at a cafe potential. You know, we were going to think about renting a unit there. And now look at it. This car park, you know, I put my car there sometimes. I mean, he, it's very, very impactful for people who have to deal with that every day of their lives. And you don't know where it's going to come next. Like, this is in the centre of town. It wasn't near anything. Uh, a McDonald's was there. A church across the road, everything was in bits inside. And, and we walked past and you're crunching on bits of glass. And there was a really weird sound. And it was just all these students inside the university just rhythmically sweeping up big piles of broken glass and concrete. It was a really strange noise. They wanted to get everything cleaned up. Uh, so that they could start repairing it and this could happen anywhere at any time and you just it, you just sort of realize what stress people live under but at the same time he said well you know we've we've got to go to work we can, I, you know, I provide jobs to people and you know people have got to live their the rest of their lives and you know while we're angry and furious and in mourning for people who were lost we're also trying to carry on life Coming out here and volunteering must take a lot from you as well. How do you find the strength to, to keep on going? I mean, in a way, we know we're in a very privileged position because we, you know, we can come and go. We can, we don't have, we didn't grow up here. I mean, I, I can't imagine what it must be like. You know, it's shocking to see this kind of damage when you, or, or to wake up at night, a massive siren coming on. But if this is the place you grew up in and it's happening to the place you went to college or whatever, it's... It, it must be really difficult. So I tried to take heart from all the people here who still have energy to keep going and who really who really sort of need the support really from abroad because they don't want people to forget about it. They don't want people to think, oh, the Ukrainian war that happened last year or something and, and there's nothing more going on. And it, it's something which I feel really you need a long-term commitment and also you need to kind of balance that with, you know, watching some TV at night or something to switch off and that there are ways of not burning out by, because, you know, here I am sitting at a nice cafe um, in the sunshine um, because you have to preserve your energy for something, you know, you don't know what's, you know, you might be woken up again at 3.30 by sirens and so on. And as, as happened presumably to us both the, the other night because it was, what was, it was 3 a.m. in Kiev. Were you in Odessa then or were you in... No, I, that night I was in Kiev and we had the windows open because it was hot and it was incredibly loud. It was like, OK, Andrew came running in from the... He said, yeah, maybe close this. <laughs> he said, if you want to go to the corridor, that's fine. We, we, we're probably going to carry on sleeping. Although it was quite loud outside. They, they, they've just got used to it by now. And it is a very surreal situation. It's very hard to explain to people how that can happen in the middle of the night and then in the morning you come out and go and buy coffee and carry on with the day but otherwise the country wouldn't function if everybody sort of spent the entire time hiding but people know what they should do and if it's you know there's a there's loads of telegram groups telling you what's happening and whether there's a missile threat or whether it's some other city that's under threat or whatever so I think as once you come a few times you get to know the ways of managing to get around more safely and, and sensibly Final question from me would be well what's in your immediate future then are you going to come back soon um what kind of volunteering efforts are you looking at at the moment where, where is the greatest need well at the moment it's really it's been really valuable sort of um being involved with bake for ukraine as a, on a sort of long-term basis because you can see through lots of projects and i've now used up my leave for the time being from from work but i'm allowed to take leave after the summer so i i'm hoping to come back in september because what we're trying to do with the mobile bakery is it's, it's now on a lorry being transported into odessa as we speak it'll get painted up and then they'll start applying for all the paperwork to take it into various areas it will be really great to see it operating and traveling around so i'm hoping to come back once that's happening and there's a couple of groups that i met while i was here one run by a British guy in, in Kiev who said, you know, maybe we can do a mission together and they, they, they send lots of deliveries of various humanitarian supplies and they're very used to operating in some of these areas and it would be really valuable to sort of um, cooperate with them and, and make use of their experience. So that would be great if we could organise something like that in the near future. Is there anything else we haven't spoken about or anything you think our listeners should know? To just keep supporting Ukraine, it's just very important to people here to know that they haven't been forgotten about, that people still really care about what's happening and that they, they know what, the trauma that's, that's still going on on a daily basis and want to keep standing with Ukraine because 
no one wants to feel forgotten about or on their own, especially when they are living this. And then there is just worse. You just think, what else can happen? Like this huge environmental disaster has just happened. And now people have to cope with that. And a lot of like one of my best friends now that I've made here is is from that region. And, you know, she's just in pieces about it. It's, it, you know, it's impossible to imagine what's going on in a family like that. So really important to people not to forget and to keep supporting the charities or humanitarian groups or spread the word, whatever you, you feel you can do on social media, all those, you know, there's a lot of Russian propaganda. There needs to be a lot of truth telling as well. And people saying, no, this is actually what's happening. And there are just ordinary people here who are trying to live their lives and they never asked for this to happen to them. Thank you very much. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. If you want to hear Ukraine The Latest as soon as it is released, do refer to podcast apps. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app and... If you have a moment, leave a review, as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Rachel Porter and Giles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells. <laughs>